Voulez-vous venir à Paris avec moi? From St Pancras Station, London. In just over two hours on the Eurostar, you're arriving in Paris at the Gare du Nord. Travelling around Paris is very easy too. The city is well served by its buses, which sometimes take you close to some good views. The metro is quick and clean, with lots of stations. Though sometimes the underground connections between lines seem further than just walking would have been. Some of the trains don't run on rails, and some go overground. There are stations with beautiful names and beautiful decors. And some trains are fully automated and don't have drivers. The RER regional trains are another option to get across the city quickly. I don't think they're called Boris Spikes here. And in France, even the red and green men are stylish. French maps and signs can sometimes also be more stylish than practical. We found an ideal apartment near the Pompidou Centre, in a quiet 16th century back street. Paris can have a reputation for some accommodation being a bit compact and expensive, but this was certainly comfortable and good value, and the perfect location. The Eiffel Tower stands enigmatically over the city. It took just over two years to build the visionary iron landmark for the Exposition Universelle of 1889, which celebrated the centenary of the French Revolution. With two and a half million rivets, it's over 300 metres tall, that's over a thousand feet. The Eiffel Tower welcomes more than six million visitors every year totalling over a quarter of a billion since it first opened. Buying advance tickets online will save you having to queue on the ground, although you may still have a lengthy wait on the middle stage between lifts. But the view from the top is worth challenging any fear of heights.
The Place de la Concorde was once called the Place de la Révolution, where royals and others met their end. The guillotine was replaced by an ancient Egyptian obelisk in 1836, and some cactus-shaped lampposts. Heading west, the Avenue des Champs-Élysées stretches two kilometres to the Arc de Triomphe, and much further out behind that is the Grand Arche de la Défense, which was opened in 1989, the bicentenary of the French Revolution. The Arc de Triomphe was commissioned by Napoleon, honouring those who fought and died in battle for France. Here also lies the First World War tomb of the unknown soldier. From the top, you can see the perfect beauty of the 12 avenues radiating from the Place Charles de Gaulle Etoile, including the Champs Elysees. Palais Garnier is the traditional home of the Paris Opera. From the 1850s, its builder, Georges Eugène Haussmann, also planned the replacement of more than half of the medieval city centre and slums with new, unified architecture, new sewers and bridges, and wider boulevards which couldn't accommodate barricades. The Boulevard Haussmann is home to many of the classy boutiques and department stores which draw shoppers to Paris, including Gallery Lafayette. Le Bon Marché is over the other side of the river, on the left bank. The food in Paris can be sublime, and eating out doesn't have to be expensive. A gluten-free diet is accommodated well, and actually surprisingly less of a problem than in England. We even found two excellent, dedicated, gluten-free patisseries. The Sacre Coeur Basilica sits proudly on the highest point of the city at Montmartre. A funicular, which accepts normal metro tickets, takes out most of the legwork to reach it. The Sacre Coeur is a Roman Catholic church dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and was built between the 1870s and 1914. Next door, and less known by tourists, is the historic 12th century church of Saint Pierre de Montmartre. This has a beautiful sense of serenity, reflection and faith, and it's worth spending some time in. Montmartre also has a lot of little shops, and has long attracted artists. You can sit for a portrait, or, like me, buy a striking painting of the Eiffel Tower. More spectacular views can be seen over the rooftops of Paris.
The Louvre lays claim to being the most visited museum in the world, with nearly 10 million visitors last year. The palace was built in many stages, starting from the middle of the 16th century, when it replaced a medieval fortress, and first became a museum in 1793. It houses a stunning and overwhelming collection of over 30,000 exhibits, but they are extremely well arranged and explained. They range from ancient antiquities and Islamic arts, to sculptures, 13th to 19th century paintings, including Italian, French and European art, and most famously the Mona Lisa, prints and drawings, and decorative arts through the ages. Buying your ticket online in advance means you can avoid the long queues, as does investing in a multi-day Paris Museum Pass, which covers entry to dozens of the city's museums and monuments. There is plenty of wide open space to stroll or just sit in the sun, a very Parisian pastime. The Arc de Triomphe du Carousel is about half the size of the better known Arc de Triomphe, which was built slightly later. From the gardens you can see in a straight line the so-called historic axis, from the Louvre Pyramid to the Obelisk, Champs-Élysées and Arc de Triomphe. Of course, over the river you can also see the Eiffel Tower and the Musée d'Orsay. The Orsay was originally a train station, but is now home to an amazing collection of 2,000 paintings by Impressionists Monet, Renoir, Sisley, Van Gogh and many more. Notre Dame is Paris's awesome and beautiful Gothic cathedral on the Ile de la Cité between the left and right banks of the River Seine. Built in the 12th and 13th centuries, the engineering and stonework, the rose windows depicting biblical imagery and the ornamentation are breathtaking, both outside and inside.
next door, the underground crypt reveals 2,000 years of the city's history through archaeology. Nearby, La Saint-Chapelle, the Holy Chapel, is an exquisite Gothic chapel built for King Louis IX and completed in 1248. The medieval church of Saint-Germain-des-Prés, on the left bank, and officially the oldest in Paris, was built as part of a Benedictine abbey, which originally dated back to the 6th century. Slightly further south, Saint-Sulpice is the second largest church in the city, after Notre Dame. The design of the west façade was inspired by St Paul's Cathedral in London. And it's also where Victor Hugo got married. Another of the oldest churches in Paris is Saint-Julien-le-Pauvre, parts of which date from the 12th century. Just south of Notre Dame, on the left bank, is the Latin Quarter. The area got its name because Latin was the language once spoken by students and their teachers here at one of the oldest universities in Europe, founded in the middle of the 12th century. The area is still bustling with university students and buildings, and buzzing with little bohemian bookshops and cafes. The Pantheon was built in the second half of the 18th century to replace the ruined church of the Abbey of saint Genevieve, who is the patron saint of Paris. A vast and stunning building, its architecture combines Gothic form with neoclassical design. It became a mausoleum with the tombs of many heroes of the French Revolution and other honoured citizens, including Victor Hugo, Voltaire, Zola and Marie Curie.
The Musée de Cluny is a wonderful medieval building housing the fascinating museum of the Middle Ages. 15th century tapestries and stone carvings are amongst the outstanding collection. The Thinker is one of the best-known sculptures at the Rodin Museum, which used to be his studio, and is further west towards the Eiffel Tower. Others of his sculptures set in his gardens include Eve and the Gates of Hell. The Centre Georges Pompidou is, to me, the most characteristic site in Paris, but only because it was on the front of my French books at school. Complete with colour-coded pipework and opened in 1977, it's home to the huge National Museum of Modern Art and an also huge public library. The Place des Vosges in the Marais district is magnificent. It's the oldest planned square in the city, built in 1612, and it's a true square, 140 metres long on each side. Victor Hugo and his wife Adele lived in an upstairs apartment here for 16 years, from 1832, when he was 30. The museum replicates different periods of his life, including while he lived here, and his home in Guernsey, while he was in exile from Louis Napoleon III. Paris is a beautiful city, with style and elegance everywhere. A city full of life, love and art. A bientôt.
Sometimes the underground connections between lines seem further than just walking would have been. Some of the trains don't run on rails, and some go over ground. There are stations with beautiful names and beautiful decors. And some trains are fully automated and don't have drivers. The RER regional trains are another option to get across the city quickly. I don't think they're called Boris bikes here. And in France, even the red and green men are stylish. French maps and signs can sometimes also be more stylish than practical. We found an ideal apartment near the Pompidou Centre, in a quiet 16th century back street. Voulez-vous venir à Paris avec moi? From St Pancras Station, London. In just over two hours on the Eurostar, you're arriving in Paris, at the Gare du Nord. Travelling around Paris is very easy too. The city is well served by its buses, which sometimes take you close to some good views. The metro is quick and clean, with lots of stations. Though sometimes The Eiffel Tower welcomes more than 6 million visitors every year, totalling over a quarter of a billion since it first opened. Buying advance tickets online will save you having to queue on the ground, although you may still have a lengthy wait on the middle stage between lifts. But the view from the top is worth challenging any fear of heights. Paris can have a reputation for some accommodation being a bit compact and expensive, but this was certainly comfortable and good value, and the perfect location. The Eiffel Tower stands enigmatically over the city. It took just over two years to build the visionary iron landmark for the Exposition Universelle of 1889, which celebrated the centenary of the French Revolution. With two and a half million rivets, it's over 300 metres tall, that's over a thousand feet. 